Okay, so let's get started. So welcome back. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, distributed system architectures, which continues from where we left off last time. Okay, so the agenda for today's class is uh, basically we have three parts to the lecture. First, we are going to look at broad architectural size styles for designing uh, distributed systems. Then I'm going to talk about client server architectures and designing distributed systems using this very popular client server model. And then the third part relates to designing distributed systems using a peer to peer model, which is an alternative to the client server architecture. Okay, So we'll go through each of these parts and I'll pause at the end of each one for additional questions. But as always, feel free to ask questions whenever you want. The online section also has opportunity to ask questions today. Okay. Okay. So with regards to our broad styles of architectures for designing distributed systems, I'm just going to go through a list of them. Okay. And you will see that there are some benefits to each. Uh, try to understand them at a high level. Some of these you may use as we go along the course for designing lab assignments and so on. Okay. So, so we look at layered architectures, object-oriented architectures. Uh, data centric architectures, event based, resource based, and a little bit of service oriented as well. So let's start and look at them one at a time. Okay, so here is a picture that explains what a layered architecture for designing a distributed system or a distributed application means. Okay, so the application is partitioned into layers that are shown. Okay, so there is these layers are numbered. Okay, each layer I Okay, can communicate with only the layer above it and the layer below it. Okay, in terms of how components of these applications communicate with each other, we have restricted each layer okay, or code at that layer to only communicate with the layer above and the layer below it. Okay, this is called the layer design. Okay, now if you've taken a class in networking, okay, you will realize that this is the principle that's also used to design protocol stacks. Okay. The TCP IP protocol stacks looks like this, for example. Okay, so there is a data link, the physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, and so on, and application layer. Each layer only talks to the layer above and below. Okay, same idea here, except that we are not talking about designing protocol stacks. We are talking about designing distributed systems. Okay? And we'll see later today an example of where this layered architecture is used specifically when we talk about multi-tier web application. Okay? In that context, each layer is essentially a tier and tier I only communicates with tier I plus one and I minus one. Okay? So that's the layer design. Okay, next up, is object-oriented architecture. Now, if you've written any program that in an object-oriented language, this should be familiar to you. Okay? Now, in an object-oriented architecture, you decompose your application into objects. Okay, objects may have state or data, okay, but they also expose interfaces. Okay. Now the way objects communicate with one another is by invoking the interface of another object. Okay. So now the main difference between an object oriented architecture and a layered design is here any object can invoke an interface method on any other object. You are not limited okay, to only invoking two other objects, which could be the layers, for example. Okay. Now, the big difference between designing a normal program that is object oriented and a distributed application is that these objects are not going to all reside on one machine in one address space. Okay. When you write a Java program, you may have multiple objects in it, okay. but they're all part of one process that's running on one machine. Okay, objects within that process can invoke methods on another object. That's no longer the case here. Okay? So you will have objects that will, let's say this object is on machine one, this object is on another machine, this object is on the third machine. Okay, now you have the same concept, but your objects are distributed, but they're still invoking methods on other objects and communicating with each other. Okay? So that's how you will design an application using an object oriented architecture and specifically distributed objects. Okay. Note here that some of these method invocations are going to actually go over a network 
they are not invoking methods within the same process. They're invoking methods belonging to another process that's running on a different machine. Okay, and we'll talk about that. It's called remote method invocation. We'll talk about that later on in this course. Okay, so next is event-based architecture. Okay, so in this case, we are going to use an event-based paradigm to design distributed application. Okay, again, some of you may be familiar with event-based programming. Okay? It's also called asynchronous programming. The application may receive events and you've got to process those events. Okay? Similar concept is true, except that we are now talking about a distributed system. Okay? So the components of the applications are not going to be running on a single machine. They're distributed over a network. Okay? Now these components are going to uh, generate events. Okay? And there is a middleware component called the event bus that you see in the middle that is actually going to take events generated by one component and deliver it to other components. Okay? And then those components use event-based processing to process those events. Okay? So what is central here is essentially this notion of this event bus that is responsible for making sure the events get delivered over a network okay? across application components. You now there are many other aspects to an event-based architecture, such as a well, publish subscribe paradigm. Okay? A common way of designing these applications is using what is called a pub sub model or a publish subscribe, where some components publish events, they generate events or data. Okay? Other components consume those events, they subscribe to those events, events are delivered and they consume data. Okay? Now again, later on in this course, when we get to middleware, we are going to look at event-based architectures and the publish subscribe model in a lot more detail. Okay, for now, you just need to understand what, at a very high level what this means. Okay, so you're using event-based uh, method to communicate across components. There's a central event bus that's delivering these events and components communicate with each other using publish subscribe paradigm where you can publish some events to the event bus and others components are consuming those events. Okay, that's how communication is going to take place. Yes, question. Okay, question is, can you think of the event bus as the internet or a network? Okay, the, so the answer is not quite. The event bus is going to use a network to deliver those events, but the goal of the event bus is to take events and decide which components to deliver them to. So you are going to subscribe to those events and based on whether there's a match, you're going to deliver an event to only a subset of those components. Any other questions on this? Okay, so that's event-based architecture. Okay, the next one is called a shared data space. Okay, now this is also referred to as the bulletin board architecture. Okay, so this cloud that you see is our shared data space. Think of this as a shared database, okay? But more conceptual, you should really think of this as a bulletin board, okay? Components, which are distributed again, are going to post events to this bulletin board, okay? Just as you go and post a note on a bulletin board saying, I want to sell some furniture, okay? And then other components can come to this shared data space and look for items of interest that have been posted, okay? If that is a match, then you are going to get uh, the item that actually has matched your interest. So if you are looking for to buy some furniture, you go to a bulletin board and see if somebody posted the note. If so, you take no note of whatever information has been posted and do something with it. Okay. Same is true here. Okay. So you are essentially going to have this data space where components publish events okay, and other components come and take delivery of those events. Okay. Now you could ask, what's the difference between a data space architecture that's also using events that you publish and subscribe and the previous example I gave where you have an event-based architecture? Anyone has any thoughts about this? Yes. So in the first model, it's the responsibility of the, of the event bus to deliver the messages to, to other parties, but in this you have to check for yourself. You have always to go to the to check if something. Okay, so I'm going to. You're right, but I'm going to rephrase what you just said. Okay, so in the previous model, 
okay, when you publish an event, okay, you have attributes for that event that allows the event bus to deliver that event to someone. Okay, you can say this is an event of this type, deliver it to these kinds of services and things of that sort. So the events could be addressed and they can get delivered. In the shared data space model, the recipient of that event is not known a priori. There may be no recipient at all. Okay, this is like you post a note on a bulletin board, but nobody is interested in buying your sofa. You're not address that note to anyone. Okay, you just put it up, assuming somebody will be interested at a later point in time. Okay, it may take the arbitrary amount of time for the event to get delivered. Okay, so there is very loose coupling in space and time as to when you publish events, whether they get delivered, when they get delivered and so on. So that is why there's a difference between the shared data space model and the event-based model that you should be aware of. Okay. Again, when we talk about middleware later on in this course, we'll come back to this. We'll understand this in a lot more detail. This is just high level terminology at this point. Okay, yes, question. Okay, question is, does the shared data space have knows about the recipients and is it more broader in concept, right? Right. So think of this as just like a bulletin board where you are publishing events for which there are no known recipients. Okay. Like when you send an email, it has always a recipient. Similarly, when you send a message across a network uh, in a distributed application, you have a recipient known a priori. And in an event-based architecture also, there is a recipient that the component has in mind. In this case, that is not the case. Okay? You, you just publish an event hoping that somebody is interested in whatever you have published. Okay? So in that sense, it is different and broader. Okay? And so the coupling is much weaker in space and time as to when the communication occurs, if it occurs and so on. Okay, this question. Okay, how will the recipient know whether there is any data if they're not connected? So first of all, components talk, communicate with each other through a bulletin board. They don't directly send messages. Okay? If you want to communicate, you post a note and then somebody else can then come and look at that note. Okay? So you need to know where the data space exists. Okay? Although you're not addressed a message, you're still posting it to a shared data space that everyone knows about. So you go there and you look for items if there are any that match your interest. Okay. 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 Next one is called resource oriented architecture. And this one you may have heard of if you know the term RESTful services or REST. Okay. So REST is an acronym that stands for representational state transfer. Okay. Or it's just acronym is REST. But the broad idea here is that distributed applications expose resources. And then resources have names associated with them. And you can invoke resources and operations on those resources. So the entire application is written as a set of resources that are exposed. And then you can essentially invoke those resources and operations on them. Okay? Now the typical way to write a RESTful application is that you're going to use HTTP as a method for communication. Okay? Because HTTP uses URLs. Okay? And URL is also already a naming scheme for resources. Okay? In the default web, a URL typically represents a web page or an image. Okay? So that's the resource we are talking about. And when you use that name, you essentially go and retrieve that. Okay? That's a standard uh, get request that you are going to make over HTTP. Okay? Now in a RESTful service, okay, you are going to use the same concept, except that resources are not necessarily data items like web pages or images. They could be code that you invoke, okay? or it might invoke code. It just represents a resource, but you can perform operations on those resources. But you are going to use HTTP to make those uh, perform those operations. Okay? You can use get, put, and so on, as we will see again later on, to perform these operations. Okay? So if you write your application this way, where you are thinking of all of the operations as operations on resources, and you are writing it or using HTTP as the way for components of your applications to communicate, you're going to get what is called a RESTful web application, a RESTful web service. Okay? Again, we'll come back to this, but that's the basic idea. Okay? Now, the other thing that 
RESTful web services do is that they essentially assume stateless execution, which means that all operations, once you perform those operations, there's no state kept saying this operation was performed. If you have to make another operation, you have to again provide all of that information again to make a different operation. Okay. So you are essentially using HTTP as a way to write your distributed application. Okay. And there are many services that use this kind of architecture. Okay. The interface is over HTTP. It's not some low level communication interface. Okay. So you're essentially using standard web protocols for writing your distributed application. Okay. Okay. So now I have a slide that explain some differences between what's called an object oriented architecture. We talked about that just now. Resource oriented architecture, which is the restful service and service oriented. A okay, service oriented simply means it's a distributed application that has exposed a service. And then you can essentially invoke uh, these services through an interface. Okay. Many distributed applications are written in that default manner. Okay, now, the term service oriented architecture or SOA specifically uh, refers to writing business applications okay, using uh, Java Enterprise Edition and things of that sort. Okay? But here we are going to use this in a, more, in a more broader sense. And we are essentially writing a distributed application as a set of services that invoke each other that we will call a service oriented architecture. Or you'll write your distributed application as a set of resources over which you can perform operations. Okay? Or you can write your distributed application as a set of objects that expose interfaces as well that you can invoke and uh, perform operations. Okay? So these are three very broad ways of writing your applications. Okay? Now I should mention that the new way to write service oriented applications is to write microservices. If you know what microservices are, you have small services that run in containers that expose interfaces and other services can uh, invoke those interfaces. Okay? That's an example of, or a new way that you start, you can write an application in a service oriented manner. Okay? If that is also restful, okay, then you will also get a resource oriented architecture and you can also have object oriented. Okay? I'm not going to go into all of these rows because I just took this uh, table from a resource on the web which is actually listed here. There's a longer description of what these mean there. Okay, all I wanted to mention is, we basically are talking about three different ways of writing an application. It doesn't matter which one you pick, there's no right or wrong. There are just three architectural style. Okay? And there are various ways, various programming languages that help you do this. You can write object-oriented distributed applications using Java, or there are Python remote objects that allow you to do this. Okay, RESTful web services, again, there are many programming languages that let you do this. Okay? And so, and so uh, that's also the case used for service-oriented architecture. Okay, yes, question. Okay, question is, what is the difference between a service and a resource? Okay, a resource essentially is like an URL that refers to something. Okay, and then you can use HTTP as a way to invoke that service and perform operations on it. Okay? So a resource oriented architecture always operates over HTTP. Okay? The calls that you're making, the messages that you're sending are HTTP messages. Okay? And those messages could have arguments that you make and then you basically invoke them. Okay? So that's called a resource oriented architecture. Service oriented architecture does not require that you run communicate using HTTP. You can communicate using other mechanisms, other networking mechanisms. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, you are not viewing the service as a set of resources. You can just expose some functions and call functions on the service. Okay? Now you can also write a service oriented architecture or HTTP in which case this will also become restful. But a service oriented architecture by definition does not have to run over HTTP. Okay? So you are just viewing this as a service with an interface. Yes, question. Yes, the question. Okay, question is, can most systems be some hybrid of the architectures? Yes, there's no clear distinction. Okay, you can have service microservices that expose REST interfaces. 
Okay, then microservice could be used, written using an object-oriented language. So there will be all kinds of hybrid you know, combinations of the three. Okay. So there, but you have to decide what is the basic architecture you pick, and then maybe if you write it in a certain way, it will acquire characteristics of the other architectures as well. Okay, question, yes. Okay. What is the so question is what, what's the difference between resource oriented and service oriented? Okay, so in service oriented architecture, you essentially have a process that is running that expose interfaces. Okay, they don't have to be HTTP interface, there's just some methods that you can call. Okay, and then you perform operations on that service. So it's exposing some service. So think of a print service. Okay, a print service allows you to print. Okay. So you can send a print job over a network and it will print for you. That's an example of a service. Okay. You're not sending the print job or HTTP or anything like that. Okay. As opposed to a resource oriented architecture that's going to essentially communicate using HTTP as your underlying protocol. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So we're done with part one. Okay. Just taking quick break. There's a career fair on February 24th. Interested in internships, jobs, please go to that. Okay. Uh, and also reminder of our class policies. Okay. I see everybody is masked. That's good. Uh, also, as you know, the device policies is you shouldn't use devices in class, except for if you're a scribe or you're actually relaying questions from the live lectures, which is why the two people in the front who will have laptops, okay, they have been granted exemptions for that reason. All right, so we are going to switch gears, move on to part two. Okay, so it's going to be client server architectures. Okay, so this is the most basic way of writing a distributed application. Okay, the application has two components, a client component and a server component. Okay, the server component is providing some sort of a service and you can write the server using any of the architectural mechanisms we talked about. Okay, and as is shown here, the client will essentially make requests okay? and then your server is going to take that request, process it, send back a reply. Okay? The request and the reply go over a network. Okay? The client and the server are communicating over a network. Okay? So now the important thing we are going to talk about is what part of the application resides at the client and what part resides at the server. How do you take a application as a whole and decide what is going at the client end and what's going at the server end, okay? And there are many design decisions here, as you will see, because application, if you think about a distributed application, has three big functions, okay? There's a user interface that it exposes to the user, okay? There is the processing level, which is the code of the application, is actually performing the processing. And then there is a data layer where if the application stores any data on disk or in databases, that's that component. Okay? So you have a distributed application. By and large, they have these three functions to perform. And then you have to decide what goes at the client, what goes at the server. And depending on what choices you make, you are going to essentially get different flavors of your client server application. And that's what we are going to look at. Okay? So let's start with a simple example. Okay, of this three layers I talked about. Okay, here's an example of a, a trivial example of a search engine. Okay, the user interface layer is at the top. Okay, typically that's a search box that you're going to provide to a user. Okay, the user interface is very simple. Okay, browser-based search box. Okay, when you type in some keywords and you hit submit or search, okay, that's going to essentially go over a message to the processing level tier. The processing tier is so shown in the middle there. It has a variety of functions. You don't need to really know all of them. But what is listed here is you take the keyword and you generate a query. Okay? And then you essentially take that query and you you are presumably gone and indexed a whole set of web pages that are now stored in an index form in some sort of a database. So your query is going to go and access that uh, database and then get some results. 
those results are going to be subjected to some sort of a page rank type algorithm. Okay, so you're going to order those results in some sort of relevance. Okay, then those ordered results are going to be converted into an HTML page. Okay, and the HTML response is then sent back to the user saying this is the response. Okay, now all of the indexing functionality is not shown here. This is just processing of a search query. This lower part, which is database, is a data layer in the application. Okay, the middle part is the code. Okay, that's basically taking a query, issuing the query, running the page rank algorithm, generating HTML, all of that. That's the code of the application. That's our processing layer. Okay, and the very top is our user interface layer. Okay. Now, in, the, in this case, it's very clear where the boundary of the client and the server is. Okay. Only part of that's at the client is the user interface. All of these other things are actually at the server end. Okay, in a typical server uh, search engine, there's not one server, but thousands of servers because a large cluster that's going to manage all of these search queries. Okay, but that's our client server boundary between the client and the server. Okay, but it's not the case that in every client server application, only the user interface is at the client and the rest are at the server. We'll see that there's a spectrum of choices available to us. Is this clear? What I said? Okay. Okay, so before I talk about the spectrum of choices, I want to introduce this term called multi-tiered architectures. Okay, so essentially in a multi-tiered architectures, you have the client and the server. Okay, and then all of the components are essentially uh, written as tiers. Okay, each tier can talk to the tier that's in front of it and the tier that's behind it. Okay, and so you will get multiple tiers. The standard way to do this is to write a three-tier architecture. And I'm going to have to draw a picture here. Give me a second. So this is your web browser. Okay, that's our client. Okay, so your three-tier architecture is all at the server. So there's three tiers. Okay, so this is our HTTP tier. Okay, this is essentially what the web browser sends a request to gets a response back. Okay. This is essentially our application tier. This is the code of the application. Okay, the HTTP server is simply going to take our HTTP request and send it to the app tier. So here's a request, process it. Okay. The application code may actually have to make queries to the database okay, in order to produce the result. So there is a data tier as well, a okay, database tier. Okay. And then responses are going to flow back. Okay, so the requests are flowing from the web browser to the server, which is the front tier is the HTTP tier, the middle tier is the app server tier, the back tier is the database tier or the data tier. Okay? And so the processing is going to go that way and then responses flow back. Okay? Now, as you can see here, this architecture is using a layer design okay? because that's what I had mentioned when I talked about layer design. Each tier only talks to two other tiers in this architecture. You don't have HTTP tier directly talking to the database, for example, or the web browser talking directly to the database. Okay. This way of writing applications is a popular one. Okay. Lots of web applications are broadly written this way. Okay. There are three tiers. Okay. And then you have essentially this layering of functionality across these tiers. Okay. So that's our three tier architecture. Okay, keep that tiering in mind because we are going to now talk about how to split our three layers that we talked about, the user interface, the application, and the database. Okay. So here you will see there are six or five different choices of how you write your distributed application. The dotted line in between is the, is the boundary between the client and the server. Everything that's above the dotted line says that in that choice, those components are at the client. And everything that's below says for that particular choice, those components are at the in the server. Okay, so we look at some of these examples. So in the first example, the user interface tier is split between the client and the server okay? because you'll see that there's a part of it there, there's a part of it here. The application in the database are all at the server. Okay, so think of this as our three tier multi-tier architecture, that's a web browser. 
Okay, so the part of the user interface, which is the HTTP server and so on, is also at the server, and then the application and database itself. So most of our browser-based applications are essentially using that model. Okay, whether you are using your webmail, Gmail, or any of these web applications that you access through a browser, essentially falls in that category. Okay. Now there are richer forms of these where the entire user interface is actually at the client. Okay, so the boundary is only the app and the database is at the other end. Okay, there are applications that will do that as well. Okay. And as you progress to the to your right, you will see now in the middle, you have the user interface and the application at the client. Some part of the application is the server, database also at the server. Can you think of examples of this model? Sorry, gaming, okay, somebody said something. Mobile application, so both of those are right. All smartphone applications essentially use this model because you download an app, it has an interface, okay, that's, that's what is exposing to you, but also has some code in the application. Okay? So that is why part of the application is there. Now, if, if that app actually talks to a backend, then we have this model. If that's a standalone app, of course, that's not a distributed application at all. But the assumption is this app is actually talking to a backend. So it could be a game, for example, as was pointed out. Okay, so there is essentially this model where part of the code is on the server, part of it is running on the phone. And then of course, all your data is also at the server. Okay. So now you can continue that progression. So here you have a user and the application sitting at the client. There's a database there. And then your user application, maybe part of the data is cached or stored at the user on the client side and the databases. So these two are more desktop based applications okay, where you might actually have more heavy duty applications where the entire application may be running on the client side. All it's doing is connecting to a database, fetching data, but every, all the processing is happening locally. Okay, because more than a phone, you're more powerful machine. So you can essentially put more of your applications here. Okay. So as you can see, there are many design choices. Which one you pick is dependent on what your application is trying to achieve, what kinds of machines will it run on at the client, what can you afford to put on the client, what should be put on the server and so on. Okay. So that's basically a way to understand client server architectures. Any questions here? Are there any questions on the chat? Okay. okay, so this is coming back to our multi-tier or three-tier web applications that I was showing a picture of. And this is simply showing the request and the response flows. Okay, so you have HTTP tier, the app tier, which could be written in Java. These days you write it in Python, Ruby, or many other programming languages. And then there's a database. Okay, and then essentially requests flow down in this timeline. So the x-axis is time. Okay, so each component is sending a request to the next component, that one sends a request to the next component, each of them processes it, responses go back. Okay, so that's a time view of how request processing is done within a multi-tier architecture. Okay, so now we'll move on to other kinds of applications that are distributed. Okay, another one is called edge server system. And the way, best way to understand this, okay, the picture is more complicated than it looks. Okay, the best way to understand this is we are going from a client server model to a client proxy server model. Okay? So rather than a client talking to a server, a client is going to talk to an intermediary, which we'll call a proxy server. Okay? The proxy server behaves like the original server, but it doesn't provide all the services of the origin server. Okay. Otherwise, it would be a server itself. There is no need to have another component. Okay. So there is an intermediary. So a client talks to proxy. The proxy can service the client request. You are done. The proxy cannot service the client request. It goes to the server and asks it for help. Okay. So that's called a client proxy server architecture. Okay. A simplest example of this, there are many examples. Simplest example of this is a proxy is a cache. Okay. So caching some content from the server and you deploy the proxy close to the client. Okay, so if the client makes a request and the response is already cached, you get a reply quickly. You don't have to go to a far off server to get your response. Okay? But if you do not have the content cached, then you are going to go and fetch it from the server. The proxy will fetch it for you and send back a response. 
is a proxy is acting as an intermediary. Okay? So that is essentially what is shown here. Okay? So those are the clients, that is your edge server as the content provider. I think the picture from the book is not doing justice to the concept, but that's what it's trying to show them. Okay? And we'll come to content distribution networks that use variety of proxy caching later on in this course. Okay? But the thing I want you to know is that what was originally a web caching architecture for deploying proxies now has evolved to what is called the edge computing model. Okay? So in the edge computing model, okay, you essentially deploy these edge servers close to the client, but they are no, not just doing caching. They are performing all kinds of other active computation. Okay? They can run code. Okay? They can run code very close to the user or their devices and give very low latency service. So you don't have to go to a cloud server, which is much further away. You can go to an edge server that's close by and get very quick responses. Okay? So this paradigm has now evolved to what is called edge computing, which is your computing at the edge of the network. Edge of the network is the first hop from where you are to where the network starts. Okay? So you deployed resources very close to the user or their devices. Okay? And these servers can provide active computation, not just cache data for you. Yes, question. No. The content provider is the server. You know, web, web caching, that's essentially your server. Okay, the edge server is where the cache is. Okay, and the client is actually there. Right, so these gray boxes are all edge servers, they're caches, right? So that thing at the top is the web server. There are four caches being shown there, okay? And then each cache is serving some clients. Yes, question. Okay, so question is, can the edge server connect to the database or the main server connect to the data? The answer to that question actually depends on the application. Okay? The application is allowing the edge to keep some data and content. You certainly, you can even have databases and edge servers. Okay? If you are only doing lightweight processing, then you will not keep that content. You'll only keep it at the central server. Okay? When you replicate data, the problem that you have to deal with is what is called consistency. If somebody makes a change to a copy of the data, all the copies that are in a network have to be updated. Otherwise you have old versions of the data lying around, then the responses to requests will be incorrect. Okay. But yes, you can certainly do that if you design your application in a certain way. Yes, question. Yeah, the question is, does edge computing means you put the server close to the edge of the network and they're geographically close? That is exactly right. That's what edge computing means. You basically put computing resources, typically they're server-like resources and the edge of the network, which is very close to the users. Okay, so, and they are geographically distributed because everyone is closer to a different edge point, right? So that's, so somebody else's edge server may not be you are at server because you are at two different geographical distant regions, right? So there will be many of these at server, not just one. Other questions? Okay, so we are done with part two, okay? And I'm going to switch to part three. Are there questions on the online channel? No, okay. So part three is now we are going to go from client server model to decentralized architectures, okay? So in a client server model, okay, the assumption is there is a distinguished machine called a server that is providing some service. Okay? There may be many servers, but there is at least one okay, that's providing as a service. Clients are simply invoking that service. Okay? They're basically making requests and getting back responses. So in a decentralized architecture, all entities are assumed to be equal. There is no client and no server. Everybody is a peer of one another. Okay. Every peer can provide a service if they so wish. They all have the capabilities that normally you would assume only the server has. Okay. So this is referred to as a peer-to-peer -peer model where one peer can act as a client and invoke services on another peer 
in this case that other peer is acting as a server to the first peer okay but this peer can also provide services to other peers in the system so it can be a server for other peers while being a client and invoking other peer services okay so in some sense your each node is both a client and a server okay they can invoke services from other peer while providing similar services to yet other peers in the network okay so that's the basic idea of a peer to peer system okay now many peer to peer systems were designed for sharing files or content in a distributed manner that was the origin of how peer to peer systems became popular so in this case the examples i am going to use are one where you are using p to p system to share content or files but you can use them to also access any kind of service okay it doesn't have to be just accessing files in a distributed store but that that's the example i am going to use to explain how peer to peer systems work okay now what is shown here in this ring is one type of a peer to peer system called cord okay this is also referred to as a structured peer to peer system because there is a network structure to this okay you will see the structure is a ring structure okay the so uh, you will see there are two types of circles there there are solid circles and dotted circles the solid circles are nodes in the network they are actual machines or peers okay now the assumption in this network is you are you you are responsible the you as in the system is responsible for storing n data items okay so they are numbered from 0 through 15 so 16 data items that you want to store in your network okay in the normal client server architecture all of this data would be on the server it will be on one machine okay that's not the case here you are going to spread the content across multiple machines okay each machine is going to act like a little server where the data it stores okay is going to essentially be served to other peers okay and then it can request other data items from other peers as well okay that's the basic idea okay so what you see now is essentially a, a ring that is numbered from 0 through n minus 1 okay and each solid circle represents a node an actual machine that is going to store all the content from the previous node to itself okay so let's take an example so that's node 4 that's a machine that's node 7 that's another machine so node 7 is now responsible for all the content after 4 so it is going to store data items 5 6 and 7 for example okay and then node 12 is going to store everything from 8 to 12 okay? and so on Okay. so that's the basic high level idea when a peer joins the network it picks a random id from 0 through n minus 1 that's not already taken by another node and it joins there so let's say new node joins your system it picks 10 and is going to join here okay now because it has now id 10 it is responsible for 8 9 and 10 as the data items it will store and it will serve okay so in this case it has to then coordinate with 12 and take over some responsibilities back saying i am going to now deal with 8 9 and 10 you can deal with 11 and 12 only okay so essentially that's the basic idea of how peers divide up the responsibility of how to take a large service and take some parts of that service in this case the service is storing data item and provide uh, a service okay now there are other aspects to this which is what is referred to as a distributed hash table so, so what what does that mean so how does a client okay these are peers how does a client decide if it wants data item 5 who to ask okay this just said how do i divide up the responsibility of which peer is responsible for what data items okay we just said let's have a ring structure okay? and then you a node joins some element of that ring and is responsible for everything from the previous node to itself in a numbered Uh, ring okay that's fine that just says who stores what now say i i am a peer or a client i want data item 5 how do i know who to ask right so that's the other aspect of a peer to peer system which is how do you query a network and get your data item okay so this in case of cord uses a special data structure which these peers actually construct among themselves called a distributed hash table think of a distributed hash table as a centralized hash table where you can hash saying who is responsible for data item 5 and it'll say that's node 7 and here it's its ip address okay 
So normally you could keep this hash table in a centralized location. Okay, so if you want to know where is five, you look up the hash table. It tells you what machine has it. You go to the machine and get it. Okay, except that there is no central server for us to store that hash table. Right? So the hash table itself is distributed. Okay, so basically the peers themselves maintain it. So there's a way to query this network where you send the query to a to any node or any peer, and it's going to route it to you through the ring. Okay, it's going to say, okay, do I have five nodes? So you basically then send it to the next node in some smart way so that you can essentially, it's like doing a search through a network. You get your node very quick, get to the node you want very quickly. Okay, because there's no real hash table. This is a distributed hash table. So you're essentially doing a hash table lookup and the hash table lookup is a message that is going to propagate from one peer to the other until it finds the peer that actually has it. Okay. Now this network, if you read the paper, the, the search is actually fast. Okay? You can essentially get to a peer that has your node, uh, I think in log n time or n log, I don't remember the ex exact property, but, but it's quite fast. Okay? In an unstructured peer-to-peer -peer network, which I'm going to talk about shortly, there is no structure to the network. You have no idea who is storing what content. Okay? In that case, the only way to find a coin is uh, find some piece of data is to what is called flood the network. You send your query to everyone saying, do you have data item five? Okay. And it's going to propagate through the network. Uh, lots of peers will receive it. And whoever has it is going to send back a response. Okay. As you can imagine, that's a very inefficient way of querying a network. If you have lots of nodes, let's say you have a million nodes. Every time you want to find a data item, if you have to send a request to all of those nodes, that's going to be an expensive operation. Okay, you want to pinpoint a node that has it very quickly without asking everybody. Okay, but there's a big difference in efficiency between structured peer-to-peer network like Cord, okay, which use a ring structure, they use distributed hash tables to essentially send the query to the right node very quickly and so on, and unstructured peer-to-peer -peer networks where there is no structure at all. And so the only way to find something is by broadcast or what's called flooding. Okay. So, so that's DHT or distributed hash table. Okay. And there's one more property that I want to mention here, which is called consistent hashing. Okay. So these are also theory concepts, by the way. I don't know if you've seen these in 611 or something like that, but they all come from theory, but they're used in systems here. Okay, so I'll talk about consistent hashing, but there's a question, yes. Will the client be able to flood all the peers in the system? So first of all, we are not going to be flooding in a structured network. Okay, this is, you're just going to send the query and it's going to hop and find the answer very quickly. In an unstructured network, okay, and I'll talk about that in a moment. I don't know, that's not on this slide, it's in two slides. You will actually flood, but the client just injects the query and the peers actually do the flooding. The client is not sending a million messages. You just send a message to a nearby peer, it sends messages to its neighbors and so on and so forth. Okay. But we'll talk about that. Yes. Okay. So that's the the question is what happens if a peer goes off and how does that get serviced? And that is exactly where I was going to talk about consistent hash. Okay? So peer-to-peer -peer networks are not as reliable as client-server network. When you have clients and servers, there's an assumption that the server is generally up. When you make a request, it's up and running and it's going to service your request. Okay? So that is not an assumption you make in a peer-to-peer -peer network because lots of the peers are simply machines that volunteers are running. Okay. You cannot assume the same level of availability as a traditional based architectures. So peers may come, peers may fail, peers may get turned off, and yet you want the system to be running. Okay. So essentially all peer-to-peer -peer networks have to have built-in for failure properties where peers just disappear. Okay. And yet you want things to work. Okay. And this is where consistent hashing actually comes in. Okay. Consistent hashing says, if I have a distributed hash table and I have distributed responsibility of some content or hashing that content across peers and some peers fail, 
how do I redistribute that hash table optimally? Okay. So you essentially want to, you don't have to go and coordinate saying peer 12 has left or disappeared. Now who should take over peers, that peers role? If you go and start asking every peer in the network is going to be expensive. You want to quickly figure out that in this case, in the case of card, you essentially tell 15 saying you are going to take over whatever peer 12 was responsible for. Okay? And just hand that responsibility over. Okay, this is done efficiently using what is called consistent hashing. Okay, it allows you to redistribute hashed objects among other machines that are still up in a efficient manner. There's a question, yes. So the question is, uh, are we assuming that there are infrequent failures? Because if there's failures, then you have to actually migrate the data and so on, right? That's your question. The first thing is when you assume failure properties, you have to make sure that you can decide who's going to take over responsibility of the failed peer and how does the data item move, okay? So essentially you are not going to migrate because the machine may just disappear. Not that it's giving you advanced notice saying this machine is going to go down in one hour, move all of his data out. Okay, the mach machines can fail without any uh, advanced notice. Okay, so you have to actually have replicate, although 12 is responsible for those data items, some of that information has to be replicated at other peers. Otherwise, there's no way to recover. Okay, there's no, no migration happening here. You just assume that you're going to do recovery. You decide which peer takes over and then whoever has replicated content is going to essentially provide it. Okay, so that's something you have to add to your network. So you're always going to replicate your content in a peer-to-peer -peer network because there is high chance of failure. And you cannot assume that you will migrate because migration assumes that you know something is going to go down, so you're actively moving data out. But you are not going to have that luxury in this case. Yeah, so if you add nodes, you're going to essentially, as I said, I, so the uh, adding nodes is straightforward. You are going to first pick an ID for yourself. You join the network at that location. Okay? And then you are going to essentially take over all the responsibilities of all the items from the previous node to yourself. And that is done through consistent hashing also. It will basically reallocate that efficiently. Okay. Yes. Is there a separate machine that does the reallocation? There is no separate machine. Everything is decentralized. There's no server to do it. So all the peers themselves have to coordinate this. Okay, so that complicates things a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to show you a different structured architecture. Then we'll talk about unstructured networks. So this is a two dimensional structured architecture. Okay, this was one dimensional. All keys had one attribute, which was an ID. Okay, so you just numbered all your data items, zero through N. Okay, the only attribute was you said data item I. That's all you can ask. And then as you basically go find it. Okay, so what if you want to have additional attributes? So you say, I give it a number and I give it a type saying I want data item five and it's a PDF file or I want data item seven. That's essentially a JPEG image. Okay, so you can have items that have multiple attributes so in this case, you're showing a two dimensional structure where each data item has two attributes. Okay, so now in this case, we have represented the attributes as numbers. So there are essentially two IDs, I and J. So essentially that becomes a coordinate in a two dimensional plane. Okay, so you essentially each item has two IDs associated with I and J. In CORD, you had only one, which was I. Okay, here I had an additional attribute. The attribute can be anything. Okay, but you hash that to a number and eventually it becomes a coordinate. Okay, so essentially each of these dots are now nodes. Okay, so nodes are now responsible for a rectangular space and all the content that maps within that space. Okay, in the previous case, each node was responsible for a range, a okay, range of IDs from the previous node to yourself. Now you have two dimensions. Right. So you're going to essentially say, I'm now responsible for this. This node here, that black dot is responsible for the rectangle that's surrounding it. Okay. Any item that actually maps into that coordinate space, it becomes its responsibility. 
okay? and so on and so forth. So you will see that now you have all these rectangular spaces and nodes. Okay? Now joining and leaving is a little more complicated here. Okay? To join again, you pick a random coordinate that's not already chosen and you know a peer will appear. Okay, now what responsibility should it pick? The easiest thing is so which rectangle did it join and split that rectangle into two. Okay, so if I pick another node here, okay, I'm going to split that rectangle and say, now you take the upper half and I take the lower, something like that. Okay? But leaving is a little more complicated. Okay? Now if this node leaves here, okay, how do you join that rectangle with someone else? It is no obvious, in this case, you can just join it to the one above it, that becomes a bigger rectangle. But that may not always be the case. Okay? So you might have to split the rectangle and say, you take this part and somebody else takes that part and so on. That is all handled by consistent hashing. In quad, consistent hashing was very straightforward, but here you can see that it's not that trivial okay? because you're talking about geometric objects representing what is your responsibility in terms of data items and so on. Is this clear? Okay, so this data peer-to-peer uh, -peer system is called Content Addressable Network or CAN, okay, C-A-N as the acronym. Okay, and it is basically has the same idea as CORD, except that everything is now in two dimensions and you can extend it to multiple dimensions. You can say each data item has three attributes. In that case, you'll essentially have all the data items in a cube of some sort. I think of them as a data point in that cube. They have three coordinates, okay, i, j, and k, and so on. Okay, this is a two-dimensional structure. Okay, question. That is essentially, think of it as an x-axis, right? You're basically numbering objects on a line, zero through n. So here you have two axes. You have numbered each object from zero through n, which is normalized to one, and another y axis, another zero through n for the j coordinate. Okay, so essentially, the coordinates x, y, or i, j can be seen as a point in a two dimensional space. In one dimensional space, you arrange that as a ring, or you could have thought of them as a line. It doesn't matter, but it's one dimension. Will this not be a consistent hashing? No, it is consist consistent hashing is a theory concept that says if you have a distributed hash table, where you partition the job of uh, uh, servicing some requests across n nodes. And if some nodes fails, how do you redistribute its responsibility? The okay, same thing will be true here. But right? if this node leaves, for example, 72, okay, you have this rectangle, you have to now redistribute it. Okay? You will see that there's no one rectangle to join it to. So you will essentially have to split that here and then say this part of the rectangle joins there. So you have to do that. All that is done with consistent hash. It will use consistent hashing as a technique. Yes. Question. Okay. Question is, is that the number of nodes that can join in uh, cord is fixed to n. Here can any number of nodes join. I think that it's the same in both cases. Okay, just because we've shown ID is going from zero through one, think of them as you could have gone from zero through N and zero through M. Okay, so M, N nodes can join because there are M, N points. Okay, these are integer points, right? This is just showing in some uh, normalized to zero through one. Okay, in that case, it's zero through N. So it's always going to be the same. Okay, so not, not the same, but they, they will have a limit. So if you have as many nodes as objects, you don't really need that many peers, as you can imagine. So the number of peers is going to be much less than the number of data items always. But there's always going to be some limit. Yes, question. Okay, does communication only happen with immediate neighbor? That's a good question. And that's essentially how query is routed through the peer-to-peer -peer network. So if I say, find me object 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, which is going to be somewhere here, right? So you have to now, you, you send it to any peer and then that peer has to say, who else to send it to? You're not going to actually send it directly to neighbors. That's not going to be efficient because it's like doing a search through the, uh, through the space to find that node quickly. So you are essentially going to route it in a way that gets to your node very quickly. 
especially if you start off far away, you don't want to go through a long chain. You want to hop across nodes and get there. Okay, so that means that you need to know how to route the query, which I did not discuss here. Okay? Just to be clear, our query routing is not been shown here, but it's those details are in the paper, which I will also put up on the course web page if you are interested. Okay, other questions? All right. So let me talk a little bit about unstructured peer-to-peer -peer system. This is how the original peer-to-peer -peer systems actually began before the structured ones were proposed. Okay? So in an unstructured peer-to-peer -peer network is best shown with some figures. Okay? So you essentially have some peers. Okay? And peers basically randomly decide some K neighbors in the network. Say so this peer picks these and, oh, sorry, this. Okay, so the, and then this peer says, I'm going to have these two neighbors. That peer says, I'm going to pick this neighbor. This one says this way, so and so on. Okay. So you have some number of peers to join the network. You pick K or random peers and you basically form links to those peers. So those are your neighbors. Okay. And so this is how the network goes. There's no structure here because you can join and you can pick any random peers as your neighbors. Okay. And then the idea is that in this case, if you want to query the network, you are essentially going to do flooding. So let's say a client here sends a query there. Okay. So it comes to this peer. This peer says, do I have the object? If the answer is no, it says, let me ask my neighbor. So it's going to forward the query along its two links to its neighbors. Those neighbors are going to recursively say, do I have the requested object? If not, they'll send it to their neighbors and so on. And soon the whole network will get flooded. Okay. And then responses are going to flow backwards okay? because each one is going to say yes or no. And then you aggregate the response. If all your neighbors say no and you are a no, then you send a no to whoever sent you the query. Okay, So the responses go backwards and eventually the client will have a response. Okay, But this is not the most efficient way to do uh, to perform queries because you are asking everyone essentially. Okay, essentially doing a broadcast using the structure of the network. So you don't ask everyone in one go, you ask hop by hop by just flooding the network. Okay? So it's not very efficient in network overhead, okay? as opposed to structured networks that are going to accidentally get you there much faster. Okay? So that's the big difference. Okay? Other than that, all of what we said is still true. Okay? Rather than picking a random ID for yourself, you pick a random set of neighbors and you join the network. Okay? Now, if you disappear from the network, peer goes away, those links break. And if it causes any network to be partitioned, new links have to be formed. So there has to be some repair process and so on and so forth. Okay? All of that is essentially dealt by peers when they essentially have uh, observed their neighbors leaving or new neighbors arriving. Okay? So, so there are many networks that had this architecture. They stayed, took a step back and many of them decided structured is better. Some of them stayed this way. So I'm going to now show you one idea that some researchers thought of to reduce the flooding overhead. Okay. And this basically uh, brings in this concept of a super peer. Okay. So because flooding is expensive, rather than asking everyone, do you have this object? Each group of peers, okay, which are shown in those circles, will elect one of their peers as a super peer. Okay. And that super peer will know all of the data items that are within those peers. Okay, so, so this black peer knows whatever is stored at these other peers in its cluster. Okay. So now flooding has to be limited only among super peers because super peers know information about other peers in their group. Okay. So this reduces your communication over it. Rather than flooding to all peers, you only flood the super peers. Okay, and the super peer tell you whether a, peer within its group has the content you want or not, has the data item. And if the answer is yes, then you will actually get the data item from the peer. You're not actually getting the data item from the super peer. Super peer simply tells you where the data item is stored. You still have to go to the peer to get it eventually. Is that clear? Yes, question. Okay. Choice of degree impacts network dynamics simply says uh, 
how many neighbors I pick decides the structure of the network and the properties of how messages propagate. If I, each of them picks only two neighbors, then you will have a, ch a network which may be long and you might have to flood more or have more hops to get to all the peers. If you have lots of neighbors, then you can get to everyone quickly because each message basically becomes K messages to their neighbors and then they become K messages subsequently. So you can flood more quickly depending on the value of K where K is the number of neighbors. Yeah. Does the network impose any restrictions? The network is the internet. There is no restriction other than the bandwidth you have on your link. So that's all there is. There is no restriction imposed by the network. These are restrictions that the application might have to impose to ensure that flooding doesn't kill the link bandwidth and so on. Okay. Yeah. So um, coming back to the super peers. So what makes a node a good choice of a super peer? If it has more resources than other peers, because it's going to handle more traffic, it's going to be getting lots of queries. Okay, so if you have more resources, you are well connected to a good network link, okay, you are a good choice for a super peer. Okay. On the other hand, if you have less resources, you are connected over a cell data connection, not a good choice okay, because you will basically take out somebody's cell cellular bandwidth very quickly. Okay, so you have to decide how to pick your super peers by looking at the characteristics. You don't randomly say node five is the super peer because it may not be the best choice to, to represent all the peers. Okay, but if you do that well, then you can limit all the traffic between all the super peers themselves. Okay? Now, there are many systems that actually use the super peers. The early one that used it was Skype, okay, which was basically started off as a peer-to-peer -peer application for making voice calls. Okay. And then uh, to, to figure out whether the other party you're trying to reach is actually on the network and where they're logged in from, they essentially constructed a peer-to-peer -peer network that kept a directory saying, is this user logged in? What is their IP address? Okay. So when you try to make a call, you essentially search the network to see where is your other party? Are they connected? What's their IP address and so on to track them down. Okay. And because flooding was expensive, so Skype essentially picked the super peer model where they picked some peer in the network. So this is somebody's machine. They are logged into Skype. They suddenly become a super peer and they have to provide a service. Okay, that's what Skype made you do. Okay. Eventually they stepped away from the P2P model and then went with a more centralized directory structure where some servers keep track of this information. But early architectures essentially use this and super peers idea was actually uh, essentially came out of early versions of Skype. Okay, so, so a couple slides and then we'll end for today. So the last thing I wanted to say about peer-to-peer -peer systems is BitTorrent, which I assume many of you may have heard of. So this is also another type of peer-to-peer -peer system. It's also used to share large files. And then the basic idea, so there are two or three nice things about BitTorrent. First is this notion of a collaborative distributed system. Okay? So what BitTorrent does is it provides you incentive for providing services to others. Okay? If you are a peer or you as a user, use BitTorrent only to download files, but you never actually provide any content to anyone else, you will see that after a while your download speed is slowed down. Okay? Because the incentive is if you provide a service to others, others will provide a faster service to you. If you are a freeloader, you only like downloading, but don't help others, then others will slow down their download to you. They will not send their content fast enough. Okay? So it provides you incentives, okay, which is why it's a collaborative system okay, to essentially provide services to others and not just take services from others. Okay? So that's what is mentioned at the last point, which is saying it's forcing altruism. You want to be altruistic, not be selfish as a peer. Okay. That's one big idea that came out of this saying, if you want users to contribute services, you have to give them an incentive. Otherwise, why should I, once my download is done, why am I leaving my peer on and providing services? I don't get anything out of it as a user. But if there's an incentive, then there is a reason for that peer to stay up and provide this service. Okay. That's one idea that came out of BitTorrent. Okay. The other idea that came out of it was this notion of parallel downloads, which is nothing specific to 
peer to peer networks at all but it is an interesting idea where if the same content is stored at, at multiple nodes let's say node 1 through n are replicating some file and you want to download a large file rather than going to one peer and say let's download this 10 gigabyte image of the linux distribution what you will do is you will open simultaneous connections to n different peers all of them have a copy and start n downloads okay so that's what is shown there so essentially you can connect not necessarily n but you can pick a number that's greater than one it can be five. It depends on what your link bandwidth is, how much bandwidth can you suck. So you can essentially start parallel downloads. That speeds up your download significantly. Over downloading a large file in sequence, you're downloading a large file in parallel. So long as you have the bandwidth, you can use the band bandwidth of multiple peers to download this content in parallel. Okay. The second big idea that came out of it, the rest of it are actually details of how the system works. Okay, so there's a BitTorrent web page, which is a web server that has a link to the content. Every piece of content has an index file called a torrent file. Okay, the torrent file essentially is what you use to figure out who is uh, going to tell you more information about the file. Okay. And then there's something called a tracker. Okay, the tracker actually keeps track of which peers are up that actually have a copy of the file. So the torrent file for a piece of content will point to a tracker node. The tracker node will say currently there are seven nodes up that have this content. You can contact any of them or any multiple of them to download your content. Okay, so, so to get a piece of content, you have to first get a torrent file that will allow you to connect to some tracker node in the BitTorrent network. The tracker node is essentially keeping track of which nodes or peers are up and let you download from them. Okay. That's how the system works. There is no structure like cord or, or uh, unstructured network. It's basically a collection of nodes that provide services. Trackers have to keep track of which nodes are what content. To file, get a file, you have to first have to get a torrent file, which is the index of that file, and then get it from some node. Okay? So that's the detail, but the important things that it allowed you to do was this notion of collaborative downloads and parallel downloads, okay? which allowed you to get large content very quickly on a set of nodes. Any questions here on BitTorrent? Okay. So the last thing I want to say is uh, a new architecture, which we won't touch upon a whole lot, but is something you should know, which is called autonomic distributed systems. Okay. So these are distributed systems, also called self-managing systems. Okay. So these are distributed systems that have built-in intelligence to manage themselves. Okay. That is why they're called self-managing. So they can monitor their own performance, their own health, and autonomically take actions to deal with problems. Okay? So you can have something called self-healing systems, uh, self-managing systems, and so on. Okay? Here's an example of how you can implement this idea in a web server or a website that you run or a web application. You can monitor your workload, okay? and then you can essentially compute what is the current workloads look like? What might the future workload look like? And if you see that the system is getting overloaded, you can start new servers to handle the additional traffic. So your application can say, I have four servers, the workload looks like it needs six, start two more. Okay. All that intelligence is now built into the application itself. Okay. This technique also is called elastic scaling, which we'll talk about separately. We won't talk about autonomic system, but we'll talk about elastic scaling as an example of built-in intelligence. So you scale up or down the user or the user. There's no administrator doing this. The system itself is monitoring itself and taking action. If some node fails, it will start new nodes to take over its task and so on. Okay. So, so you can also design your distributed systems or add intelligence to your distributed system to take actions okay, without any human intervention. Okay, this is called autonomic computing or autonomic distributed system. Okay, in, the co in the context of this class, we'll talk about how to use this to build websites that can scale up or down themselves without users doing anything, human administrators doing anything. Okay, then one last comment about how this is done. Okay, so here is a somewhat looks like a complicated picture, but what the monitoring that you are doing essentially uses what is called control theory. Okay. So in control theory, okay, you give a goal to the controller. 
and the controller tries to ensure that the goal is met. If you start deviating from the goal, it takes action. That's the basic idea. Okay? There's a controller that has been given a goal and then when you keep track of what is going on in the system and if you see that the system performance deviates from the goal, take an action. Okay? Simplest example is you say, I want the response time of this web server to be 100 millisecond. That's my goal. Okay? So as the workload changes, it keeps track of how quickly are the responses going back from the server. If the workload goes up, server gets overloaded, the response times are going to go up because you don't have enough capacity to serve requests. So in that case, you may deviate or exceed the target goal. So then the controller will say, I'm actually going away from the goal. I need to take an action. In this case, the action is you actually start new servers. Once you add capacity, you can now service the increased workload. Your response time will come back down. Okay. All of this can be done using many different techniques. One of them is control theory. Okay. The more modern ways, let's use machine learning or reinforcement learning to decide what actions to take. That's also a way to build autonomic uh, distributed system. Okay. Regardless of what technique you use, whether it's control theory, machine learning, reinforcement learning, the broad idea is actually captured in this figure here. Okay. You're monitoring the system. You're trying to compare the performance of the system using that monitor data to some target performance. If the target performance is not being met, take action. Okay. That's the basic idea. Okay. Now you can do this using control theory. You can do this using RL. You can use machine learning. That Those are all techniques to implement this basic idea. But that's how autonomic systems work. The reason you should know this is large applications actually have built in intelligence because you don't want human administrator to sit there and look at the watch over the system 24 7. If something goes wrong, the system should try to fix it okay, to the extent possible. It's easier said than done, but that's the goal. Okay, any question? Yes, last question. What does self healing mean? Self healing means that you can deal with failures. Okay. He, you're healing the system, you're auto, automatically dealing with failures. If a node crashes, the system is monitoring the health of all the nodes. In this case, if a node crashes, it will say, I will start up, I'll either restart the node, reboot, or I'll start a new machine and let it do the work that it does. So it's healed the system. Okay. Okay. So we are again a little bit over time. So we'll stop here today, continue next time.